Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Matt Horn is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Five light years across. That's the size of the gravitational anomaly. Where is it headed next? It could go anywhere. And we may not have any kind of warning at all. Federation, non-Federation. This anomaly threatens us equally. Whatever it is, we'll figure it out together. Indeed, we are more than allies. Captain Burnham, make no mistake. You are in charge. She has faith in me. We are facing something we don't understand. Something that could tear us all apart. But there's only one way to confront the unknown. Together. We have Blue DeBario talking to us from where you talk to us from Blue. I am actually in London right now. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why are you over here? <laughs> well, I came over. Uh, I came for the um, the last convention that was a couple of weeks ago, but I uh, extended my stay because I, I went to school here. I went to Lambda, so I wanted to see you know friends and everybody that I have over here. It's like a second home. So yeah. I'm, I'm over here. Mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned Destination Star Trek, and I have to sort of throw that in. I suppose I might as well throw it in now because it is part of the fandom. What was it like? That was incredible. I've, I've only been to like f- maybe three or four conventions at this point. Every time was really incredible, and this one was no different. They were sort of a little panel planned that was sort of uh, like an LGBTQ plus history of Star Trek panel. Uh, that just a few of us were doing and they put us in kind of like a small corner of the room you know with like maybe four or five rows of chairs and when we showed up there it was like the 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 rows were filled and then there were like nine more rows of people standing kind of in every direction who had just shown up for that The, the queer community that we had at that convention was insane and it was i mean wilson started crying like it was like it was just a really really meaningful and wonderful moment to have it's interesting when when you think about conventions because obviously star trek's now what 50 years old and obviously conventions in the 60s and 70s weren't really well known but obviously now there's this massive huge community of fans who cosplay they do fan art What's what's the response been like for you, yourself? It's been really lovely, and it kind of brings a different meaning to doing this job and being a part of this universe. I, of course, have uh, a bunch of like trans kids who will message me or come up to me and talk to me about their experience, or just anybody under the LGBTQ plus umbrella. Then I also get people's parents, mm. parents of you know queer kids saying like, this allowed us to have a conversation like you know my my kids showed me this and it allowed us to talk about it or we're we're a trekkie family and and it 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 validates (laughs) you know their kids experience which shouldn't have to be a thing but i remember growing up with nothing on tv and it was impossible to to explain to anybody what i was feeling in my experience I, i i had nothing to go off of nothing to be like that's that's what i feel like having parents uh talk to me and message me has been really insane in in a good way well obviously we should mention it is december the first do i put christmas music here do i have to (laughs) do i have to yes december the first it's 24 days till christmas we're all wearing masks again apart from us so because we're not in the same room (laughs) yeah it's december 1st i mean with with the news of this new variant 
I tend on the side of overcautious, mm. like to constantly be masked if I'm out and double vaxxed. I just got my booster as well. And I urge anybody, if you can, please get vaccinated. It's more for everybody else around you than it is just you. If it's going to be our norm for a while, I think it's easier that we're all on the same page mm. than if we're butting heads about it. I do have to ask the question which I've asked since January the 1st. What was 2020 like for you? 2020 was hard. I mean, I haven't met anyone who has a different answer than that for that year. I was very, very lucky to be able to go back to work filming during that uh, during that year. And that was something that I'm very grateful for uh, to be able to get the chance to work. You know, even with all of the restrictions, because uh, we were in Toronto, it was very, they were very strict with all of the regulations. We were getting tested, you know, three, sometimes four times a week, uh, constantly rapid tested because there are so many people in our crew, but they did the best they could, you know, under the circumstances before we had the vaccine and everything. We were one of the first productions to go back to work. Well, obviously, the reason why we've got you here is to talk about Star Trek Discovery Season 4. Hmm. The first thing I've got to get out of the way, I think we both have to get this out of the way. I want to thank, if it was the cast that did did this, I want to thank the cast pushing for the international release of the show, given the fact that days before it was due to be released, they pulled it A, off Netflix, and then they pulled it off UK streaming altogether. I think it's everyone as a whole that we can thank as well. Like talking directly to us and us talking directly to you know anybody that we have contact with who's you know in kind of in charge of the show was above us because it was hard i mean we we found out sort of what everyone else did it was maybe a couple days after destination star trek here so it, it it was a huge shock to us as well and then it was sort of felt like all hands on deck of everybody just being on the same page of like okay well how do we fix this as fast as possible mm. what can we do to get this everywhere it needs to be so it was very much yeah like having a, having a mini heart attack for a second <laughs> um and then trying to pull together and see what can be done and i know it's been put on uh another streaming service here uh in the uk and i know they're still trying to get it everywhere else because it's still not available everywhere else so yeah it's mm. it's complicated we're still working to change it uh, in whatever capacity that we can that we're able to as a cast everyone's voices matter so the fact that all of the fans were so adamant allowed us to be adamant you know and have everyone behind us as well to be like okay something needs to change here we can't just cut everyone off from this it's it's a familial universe it's it's a show about family and about hope and about love and the world so it Mm. you know it needs to be everywhere let me go through what options that the uk has specifically so you you mentioned the streaming service it's pluto tv that's that's got the rights to it and i found that surprisingly easy to download as an app on my phone and then look at when it was the only problem is with that is you can only watch it once and you can't rewind it okay so it doesn't let you okay i see what you're saying so basically you're back to the 90s when star trek was you know tng ds9 voyager you were watching it per week but yeah. you couldn't then go back and watch it again if that makes sense unlike what we have now which is streaming and you can play it again and again and again so obviously you've got that you've got the second way of doing it which is amazon prime and that costs one pound 89 an episode i've been doing it that way and then of course you have the third option which we won't talk about nor condone emerald chain basically yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> everyone knows where i'm going with that <laughs> yeah, yeah. So season four, uh, I've seen the first two episodes. I mean, where do you start with the first two episodes? That's that's a question in itself. The first question I've got, and you can't really answer this, is what on earth is this gravitational thingy? <laughs> you are right. I can't fully <laughs> answer that. But, I mean, I can say that it's uh, really terrifying. They made it something that, you know, to even think about... To even think about it, you know, happening in this in this world where we are in our time right now, the whole thing is very terrifying in the way that these are insanely intelligent people. They've been through everything possible, and this is something that 
no one has any idea where to even start with it. And I think that's what made it so terrifying to, to play, to read, to be in it. Um, and, you know, there, of course, were kind of lines drawn over to the pandemic since we started this all when there was still no vaccine, when nobody knew what to do. You know, we were still, I was still getting my groceries and cleaning off every individual item because we didn't know if it was, you know, by touch or, or what was happening. Mm -hmm. Doing this at the same time was a little scary. Um, but yeah, to not have anybody on the crew know where to begin with this put us in a really scary and interesting place to start with. I'm going to sort of cross over to a different fandom now, and I feel sorry for Star Trek Discovery in some respects on this, because Doctor Who, I'm not sure if you've seen Doctor Who this mm -hmm. this season of Doctor Who, has got Jodie Whittaker facing something that's quite similar in terms of planet destroying. Really? Yeah. That's really interesting. I know that there's more like intricate bits to it that I can't get into yet, but as a whole, yeah, I, I can see the similarity for sure. Mm. So obviously, let's talk about Adira. They've sort of brought a lot of comfort to fans, haven't they? I never know exactly what to say about all of it. Adira at this point is is very close to who I am and, and my own experience. And I've said that before, and I, I don't think I'm ever going to get the chance to, you know, have this kind of an experience with a character again, where it's so interlinked. Because it's it's, you know, everything I wanted from being a kid and... If I just had this on my TV one day, it would have changed my whole life. So it's very, very near and dear to my heart to be able to be doing this and learning and growing with the character as well has been a huge life-changing thing for me. When you got the role, had they already planned out where Adira would be going in terms of the future? I don't think so. I think, you know, originally, you know, there was a storyline with, with Ian and myself, uh, with Gray and Adira, but we didn't really know where it was going to go after that. And, you know, given that when we both came on, the writers and producers were very open to us sharing, you know, what, what we wanted from our story, that I, I think it was always meant to be something that was very much like all of us working on it together which I really appreciated. I, I, I kind of liked that, you know, it wasn't something very streamlined and that we had no control over. I, I liked that we got our say in, in everything. And is it true you prepared for the role by looking at episodes of DS9? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't grow up a huge Trekkie, so when this job came into my, you know, mm. this whole universe came into my line of sight, friends that I have who are Trekkies and, you know, who've grown up with it were immediately like, okay, you need to watch DS9. Mm -hmm. uh, given, mm -hmm. you know, what this character is and what the story is so far, you need to watch Jadzia, you need to go through all of that. So that was the first thing that I jumped to. It's mm -hmm. become my favorite now um, of everything. I don't know if it's because I watched it first or what it was, but yeah, definitely DS9 is my favorite. It's really daunting jumping into something this big. Uh, I wish I had grown up with it that's the kind of feeling you get of like, this would have been nice to, you know, have on, you know, a Sunday morning or just, you know, as growing up as a kid, but it's such a huge, like timeless universe. And it's, it's just insane to be a part of it. I mean, going back to the fandom again, I can remember a lot of people saying that they thought Adira might be Adira Dax. I did see a lot of that, um, <laughs> which is really, really interesting. It's something I really love about this fandom and the fact that it's been around for so long, there's so much that you can connect things to. You know, the more branches of this universe that get released, that you know, the, that keep being created and written, the more stuff within canon that people can go off of to be like, okay, this could be connected this way and this way and this way, and have it every once in a while actually work out that way. Like it's it's just a, a beautiful tapestry that's been built. So I love seeing all of those. <laughs> Mm -hmm. theories and everything i really do i want to go back to season two quickly and obviously season two you had control which was fine you had all the cast usual cast as they were but then something happened and i don't know who cast anson mount as pike but what an absolute <laughs> that's eerily eerily like to the extreme eerily accurate Season two finale was just, I can't think of anything wrong with that at all. There's nothing wrong with the season two finale at all. 
there seems to be obviously a link to lower decks because of the whole Calypso Zora thing that's going on, which you can't talk about. I know you can't. <laughs> As to whether whether that actually happens, we don't know. And then, of course, you've got the connection point in episode two, which has just come out, which was you guys are all looking at Grey's construct, I suppose it is. Yeah. And obviously, <laughs> yeah. um, Wilson's character makes reference to the fact that they tried it in Picard, but it hadn't really worked. And is that a foreshadowing to say, well, you know, we've enjoyed doing two seasons of Picard. Yeah, we'll finish, finish it there. <laughs> no. I do like that that was um, referenced uh, by Culber, but I, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't say it so much as a foreshadowing. And it's a completely different time now, different technology, but there is still the fear of like, okay, the one thing that we did have to go off of didn't exactly work. So there is a fear of like this, okay, maybe failing for gray but uh yeah we did we did promise and as we wilson and i have said kind of everywhere like culver made a promise that gray would be seen and he fulfills that promise and i'm not going off on a tangent but that's my happiest point of this whole season is that we got to do that do we find out more about the towels the towels before yes yeah Man. and that is something that i wanted i hope that continues to be explored it's one of the most interesting parts of Star Trek as a whole for me. And I know I'm biased because, you know, Adira has a symbiote, but still, I think it's so beautiful and complex and interesting and how it works, you know, with within uh, a being and, and how those consciousnesses exist and, you know, think in real time is, uh, yeah, it's, it's just very interesting. Obviously, going back to DS9 with, with, with Dax, with Terry's, Terry's version of Dax, there was an episode where there was a secret Dax, which was a murderous Dax. We're led to believe that Grey died and then it got put into Adira, but was there a bit before the... Well, you went on a, <laughs> you went on a spray. I think it was very uh, linear in the way it happened. I do remember that. I love that episode and storyline. I think it was very seamless in the way that it happened with Adira and Grey, and I think that it is, you know, yeah, I, I think it'd be very clear to Adira if it was anybody other than Grey, or, you know, even a different version of that. I mean, forget me not, that's the episode it's called, isn't it? The one that, yeah. I cried at that at the end, because it was just so perfect. It was, it was, it was such, it was yeah. such a perfect episode. Filming that episode was the most meaningful and wonderful thing I've ever gotten to do. And it felt, it felt like what you just said, it felt like that during the entire time filming it. It felt like this is so special. Coming to set to do it every day was just, it was like a breath of fresh air and scary and wonderful and exciting. Um, and just being surrounded by the best people. I got to be with Sonequa for the first time during that and that was incredible. And yeah, just being with her and Ian was, I just felt like a huge blessing. I do have to ask Blue, apologies in advance, okay? You're not leaving this, are you? I I never want to leave it. I'm very very happy to be here and to be a part of this. So not not on my watch. Because <laughs> <laughs> obviously, I mean, there was the whole thing with Terry and Nicole, and we won't get into that. But you know, because it's obviously a trill, you can continue it on by having different actors. Yeah, yeah like the Doctor. <laughs> Funny enough. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, Doctor Who fans and Star Trek fans are going to hate me. Obviously, where does Adira go this season? In sort of a roundabout way, without giving any spoilers away. Without giving any spoilers away, can I say? I can say that uh, Adira's connection to Colbert and Stamets grows in a really beautiful way. And I can also finally talk about, uh, since we've already seen a bit of it, uh, Adira and Tilly's relationship, which... I was really waiting for and hoping that uh, I would get time with Mary and those two characters would get to connect because I think that they're so uh, intrinsically similar. I really wanted to see them interact and um, there's there's a good a good chunk of that throughout the season which I, I love and I freaking love Mary so much. It made it to, made 2020 feel a little better <laughs> getting to do all of that. I'm very excited for that and with Colburn Sammons as well that that family grows in a really beautiful way and and yeah of course the connection with with gray gets interesting as well and and 
it goes into interesting places within their relationship because of, you know, this whole idea of incorporation and, you know, not having gray just being seen by myself. So there's a lot. <laughs> I mean, if we're talking about Anthony and, and Wilson, that's a perfect, perfect couple. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> On screen and off, just as as friends and people that have known each other for so long, they're just the two best people to be around. They mean the world to me. They've they fully have become like parental figures to me, and they're they're huge uh, mentors for me in every aspect of my life. And so, getting to have that on screen and off is again a very huge blessing. I I can't say enough how lucky I feel to get to work with this specific cast of people because every single one of them is just insanely wonderful and special and unique uh but these two are yeah they're so special i'm gonna go on about one character that's not said enough about grudge the cat oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) i still haven't gotten to meet the cat Oh. And I'm so sad. I mean, I am also allergic to cats, but oh. I don't know if I would be allergic to Grudge. But I love Grudge so much. I would love to do a scene with Grudge. <laughs> so it is not the kind of person who would say, right, okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm licking Grudge and going off in the ship. Bye. I love cats. I don't think Adira would love cats. I suppose I have to ask the question then, does Grey interact with the cat? Does Grey interact with the cat? <laughs> <laughs> I also can't. It's so hard. I can't. I can't say anything. We should put the cat on the captain's chair. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I, I want. I want Grudge to have free roam of the ship. I think that'd be the most fun. <laughs> I was actually thinking that that Grudge might be a shapeshifter, and then somehow one day it will go. No. <laughs> nah. <laughs> nah. I'm alright, thanks. I'm just happy like this. Yeah. <laughs> Here's some writing goal for you, writers. Yeah, don't don't follow these ideas, please. Don't 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 let it be my my fault. Um, obviously, if we're talking about the future of the show, I mean, obviously, you've gone forward into the future. I mean, I've heard many interviews where they've said that's it. Once they've gone to the future, they're not going back. Interesting. I get that, but I also don't like to close it off. I think that's what makes Star Trek so fun. Is you know, no matter what these crews do, how how severe some of the choices are and some of, you know, where they end up going is I think it's always what makes the show interesting to be able to go back, whether that's, you know, in in flashbacks or in the literal sense, which, you know, so many of these branches have done. And I think that's, again, going back to the fans, like connecting things and being, oh, could this be a part of this thing that happened 20 years ago? That's what makes it so special. So I, I wouldn't close that off. I think it's more interesting to think of, you know, the possibility of, one of the things that I'm I'm surprised and not surprised at the same time is in Picard, they brought back Q. Where's Q and Discovery? We get asked a lot of like uh, what other shows we want to overlap with and what other storylines we want to go into. I, I would just love a crazy like you know some characters from Lower Decks just pop up on our bridge and we go to like it just I I, I would love a giant webbing it would be really fun. <laughs> you you want a Marvel verse essentially? Just for an episode or two, just to have like complete chaos would be so funny. There's been talk about somehow bringing every single show into one big massive film, or I suppose TV series. Maybe it could be done. I suppose. I mean, it would be an insane feat to try and accomplish. You know, within a film or within something to be able to connect everything. It'd be incredible. This is such a long-standing franchise. There are so many people who've been a part of it. It would be insane. Mm. The interesting thing I'm slightly worried about at the minute, and I have a feeling that they may have done it, and it's not a bad thing. I'm guessing you've seen The Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So obviously everybody, spoiler alert, will know that Luke Skywalker comes back, but it's a de-aged Mark (laughs) Hamill who's playing Luke Skywalker again. I wonder if Strange New Worlds is going to do the same thing, but de-age William Shatner. Oh, interesting. Of course, as Star Trek fans, why did I not mention this at the start of the show? William Shatner went into space. (laughs) (laughs) That was the craziest thing to hear about. I saw it 
on my phone when I was like waking up one day and I was like, I think I'm still dreaming a little bit. And I was like, no, 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 this, this happened. Yeah. It's again, insane to hear how it went and to hear about the experience. It's really heartwarming. Mm. Going back to series four of Discovery, are there any sort of funny anecdotes you can share about the production of the series? I mean, there were definitely like humorous moments, but it was also such a tense time that we were filming. So it, I think the, the the humor or any like fun moments came out of feelings of like, this is so insane that we're doing this right now. This is so insane that this is where we are, that we're just in and out of like, just taking a mask off to do the scene and immediately putting the mask back on. Like, it's just crazy where we are right now, those kind of moments. But my favorites to always talk about are kind of occasionally walking outside of a soundstage and there's just, you know, like an alien having a cigarette. That for me is my, it's just my favorite thing in the world to just see (laughs) walking around our lot. It's, yeah, it's just great. I did have a fan question, actually. If you could play another character apart from Adira, who would it be and why? I will always say Spock first. And then, weirdly, I think I think Stamets. But at an older time in my life, I feel very, very connected to that character in a lot of ways, and to Anthony as well. I think that, you know, if I were imagining myself, like, around Anthony's age, that is something, that is the person that I would want to play. Where I am, I'd want to do Spock, for sure. Well, they asked me, unfortunately, as well. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. I mean, having, like, an actual member of a race is a bit... Unless it's a villain, is a bit, sort of, a hit and miss. Uh, I would probably say Q. Yeah, that's very fair. <laughs> I'm available casting. <laughs> <laughs> they have shunted characters into different shows. I mean, with, like, Worf, that's a great example. TNG, yeah. then went to DS9. Miles O'Brien. TNG went to DS9. Obviously, um, Philippa Giorgio, Discovery, and now potentially Section 31. Which I, is, I think, great that they can do that because there are characters within all of these shows that you don't, you really don't want to lose and you really don't want to stop watching. And I think the fans of, of Star Trek are brilliant for that and mm. being like, hang on, no, we want this to continue. Like, we need this character, this person to continue. And then those things can happen. Do you ever wonder what Gene Roddenberry would have thought about now? I always think that sometimes when I'm watching Discovery, and I'm thinking he never got to see the prequel film, you know, the Kelvin timeline, never got to see Picard, he never got to see Discovery. I always wonder what his view would have been of the franchise now, as it is. I I always like to think that it would have made him smile because of, you know the the message of wanting to give people hope i think that there are now so many branches of this show and this universe that it kind of does reach every kind of person every kind of fan every kind of person that we have on this earth can find something that connects to them within one of these at least one of these shows one of these films one of these shows one branch of this uh whole universe i like to think of it that way you can tell anybody to watch Star Trek, and if you know them, be like, I think you would like this one, or you would like this mm, character. Mm, mm. There's something for everyone, and these are all characters who want, you know, nothing but love and hope for the future. So there is someone for everyone to inspire them to want that uh, in their own life. I think, and I'm going to say it as a personal opinion, because obviously we will never know, but I think he would have been really shocked at the sort of the response that the public had in terms of COVID-19. If you think about it, we were all going about toilet rolls for one month. I don't know that any of us could have predicted what our response as just human beings on this earth right now would have been. There are very few, probably very, very few people still remaining on this earth who have lived through something similar to this. So it was very much like, you know, showing a baby something for the first time they've never seen before Mm, and mm. trying to comprehend it and understand it and live around it. And I think that, you know, we just got a lot of panic, but it was just a lot of fear, of course. I don't know what else it it, it could have been at that moment of like, oh, this is, God, we are incredibly threatened right now. Sort of from zero to a hundred, it felt like 
and we didn't really know how to mm. fix it or what to do or how to handle it. So I kind of understand, you know, at the beginning of it, everyone's reaction, however that, however people took it, however people reacted. I, I, I don't think that I could tell anyone anything different because I had the same thing of just complete and utter fear. Well, let's talk a bit about you, Blue, you yourself. What made you want to get into acting in the first place? I kind of always wanted to do it. I mean, I always knew that I wanted to do something in the arts, at least. But theatre had been a part of my life since I was, you know, walking a, a tiny, tiny, tiny kid. I did Shakespeare very young at, like, a little uh, theatre where I grew up. And, um, yeah, theatre was always a huge part of my life. And then as soon as I started getting into watching movies and uh, TV, it was very, like, clicked very quickly of, you know, oh, I, I, I want to do screen. I really want to do film. There's something so intimate and wonderful about it. And the rest was... was a lot of luck a lot of really good people helping me along the way a lot of really wonderful teachers putting their faith and time into me to mm. get where i am mm. i'm gonna ask the question that i know for a fact most fan conventions you'll get asked <laughs> and it's one that's in my podcast so that's fine what advice would you give to anyone wanting to pursue a career in the industry <laughs> oh, it is an insane job and it is an insane industry and sadly i think it's still in a place of kind of money ruling over everything which you know a lot of industries are that way obviously but i i think that it's sad that it's still that ingrained in in the arts as an industry and acting but i think the best advice i could give anyone is to surround yourself with people who are genuinely excited about your future and about your future career, people who want to uplift you and help you get there, whether that's teachers, also other actors, because it is, it is a competitive industry. And, you know, there are sometimes people who don't quite feel that way and, and won't want to put 100% their energy behind getting you to a better standing or helping you further yourself along your journey. I think the people that you surround yourself in this industry is probably the most, one of the most important parts of keeping yourself sane and happy and fulfilled. I, yeah, because I got really lucky and had a few, like, just gems of people. Lee Floden, a teacher I had throughout high school, I wouldn't be here without her. I wouldn't be doing this job. I wouldn't have gone to Lambda. I wouldn't have done anything. There's certain people that will really just put their heart into your betterment and your future. And if you can have at least one of those, I think you're on the right path. Are there any roles that you haven't done yet that you would like to do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. I would love... I really want to go back to theatre <clears throat> when possible. I do really miss it. I, I would love to do... Uh, I'd love to be in Angels in America at some point in my life. Um, I would love to, this is a weird one, but I, <clears throat> it's funny speaking of Marvel earlier, I want a trans superhero. I just want, mm. or even to just like Spider-Man, but trans Spider-Man, mm. let me in there. I really, that would be so fun and thrilling just having been through so many aspects of my life where, you know, parts of me really weren't accepted to now where, you know more of mm. me is but not everywhere and it's still just a mixture i just i i would love to get into that i would love to see some trans rep uh within the marvel universe and i i would love to be a part of it mm. if and when it happens i think it does need to happen that would be really fun so two very different <laughs> things there but yeah correct me if i'm wrong because I'm, I'm thinking back to season three which by the way i can't see Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> if I recall, is it Adira or Grey who plays a musical instrument? Both of us. Uh, at the beginning, it's it's uh, Grey. I believe that Adira originally played uh, a different instrument, but not as good as Grey was with the cello. And then, yeah, you're right. When when uh, I did incorporate uh, the symbiont, the, the, the cello, the knowing mm. of... of learning of cello was ingrained into uh, Adira's ability as well. And then mm. they were able to play as, as beautifully as Grey was. Is it you playing it? It is me playing it sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes it is a wonderful, 
a wonderful devil that I had who was actually a cellist. <laughs> but listen, Ian and I had a bunch of cello lessons. Uh, we would constantly go in. Uh, we had a wonderful teacher who would have just full on lessons with us. And it was very humbling because cello is so hard <laughs> and it is so hard to even make two notes sound good. And so then you, you know, you watch, I would watch our teacher and just do it with ease and just be, be amazed, amazed by it. But yeah, half of the time it would be us and half the time it would be um, a double for us who was an actual cellist. Uh, but we did learn, we learned all of it mm. and it, it probably just would not have sounded as good if it was just what we were playing. The reason, the reason why I'm asking, there is a genuine reason why I'm asking, it's because obviously in the interest of Star Trek, Obviously, William Shatner released a album, multiple albums, actually, in fact. And Leonard Nimoy, sadly passed, released a number of different albums as well. And I'm just thinking, could you and you and Ian maybe do a Christmas album or something? One you could <laughs> sing or, you know, I don't know. Christmas album. Ian and myself, we both sing. I wish I could play an instrument. I used to play the violin and the piano as a kid, and then I stopped. But I have always wanted to incorporate music into what I do and we did a lot of musical theater growing up and I uh, sang jazz as well because my dad's a, a jazz composer so singing has always been a huge part of my life so musically yeah I would I would do anything where I got to sing in any capacity I wish I could also play an instrument that well but mm-hmm. <laughs> we're both very very interested in in, in music and I, I think that it's very cool that so many people within Star Trek have gone into it I mean I don't think you guys have sung together yet, have you? Is it something that could happen? I suppose, maybe? I would love for that to happen. I would love to be able to sing on the show, especially because we have so many singers Mm. on our show already. I think it'd be really exciting to do something with that. Do you know what? I've been meaning not to say the word (laughs) anonymous. That word, I can't say. Honestly, me and the girlfriend have spent the last half an hour before this interview trying to get me to say the word anonymously. No, anonymously. Ano- yeah, yeah, yeah. Ano- anomaly. 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 Or we could just call it normally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. Hashtag normally. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to give you a one-minute plug, Blue, a one-minute plug to plug Star Trek Discovery Season 4. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, uh, Star Trek uh, Season 4 has just been released. Uh, and we are trying uh, our hardest to get it on as many platforms as possible and to everyone in, in the world as fast as possible um, because we know that it matters to everyone and you all matter to us. Uh, so that's uh, the second episode has been released uh, as far as that goes. And yeah, that's um, the main thing I'm very excited for. Uh, otherwise, I'm uh, on Instagram and Twitter at, at Blue Del B. And yeah, you can message me, send me whatever you want. I love fan art. I love hearing from everyone. Yeah, that's me. Well, Blue, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. Thank you. It's been really, really fun to be on. Mm, obviously, I'll have to get you back. <laughs> yes, yeah. Come season five. <laughs> yeah. Don't be stupid. Keep it going, you know. <sighs> yeah, that's yeah. all I'm going to say. Well, thanks very much for your time, Blue. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye now. All right, bye.